Okay, why don't we um, get started? Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Frank Siegel. I'm the uh, chairman of the business law and co-chairman of the cannabis business law group with uh, my partner, Scott Mosco. And uh, with me also is uh, head of our banking, cannabis banking, Katrina Skinner. Uh, and uh, this is a continuation of a series of webinars that uh, Burns and Levinson has been doing uh, throughout the year uh, in the cannabis space. Um, we are um, very dedicated to this space. We were one of the first law firms uh, to enter the space over eight years ago and launch a dedicated practice group, which today um, has uh, over 15 attorneys and clients from Boston to California. And we truly cover the entire spectrum. Um, we're a leading uh, corporate M&A firm and we brought that expertise uh, to the cannabis market over eight years ago. And today we're doing uh, transactions uh, throughout the space representing state, local, regional, multi-state operators um, from startups to uh, exits. Um, and one of the areas that we're particularly proud of leading um, in the space is on the banking regulatory side. Uh, and uh, Katrina Skinner joined us uh, as a partner. It's been almost six, eight months now. Uh, Katrina was the uh, president and general counsel of Safe Harbor and really uh, brings an incredible expertise on the uh, cannabis banking regulatory side uh, to our clients. And we were thrilled that she joined us. And uh, as part of that um, uh, department, one of the things we focus on is advising our clients on uh, credit unions, uh, state chartered banks, um, other companies, uh, dealing with the banking issues in the industry. And today, um, we're thrilled to have uh, our friends at uh, Hub uh, join us. We do a lot of work with them on the insurance side. Uh, and we're gonna meet um, Patrick, who's one of the heads of the uh, cannabis group there. And we're gonna talk about um, protecting directors uh, and officers uh, in cannabis banking and uh, the kind of coverages that are out there. So uh, with that, I wanna turn it over to my partner, Katrina and um, she'll lead us into the uh, webinar today. So thank you again for joining us. Thanks, Frank. Um, hello, everyone, and happy holidays. Uh, like Frank said, I am working closely with our cannabis, all of the associates and uh, my partners in the cannabis advisory department to advise financial institutions throughout the country on how to provide services compliantly to cannabis um, operators both plant touching and non-plant touching. Um, this topic is very timely. We work closely with trusted vendor solution providers who are also out there educating financial institutions about the space. We've got a couple blog posts that are um, a recent blog posts that deal with what we're calling the green wave on what happened after the election throughout the country, which um, legalized marijuana in some new states and also uh, legalized adult use marijuana in some other states that have been medicinal. So we've got five new states, including South Dakota, Montana, Arizona, Mississippi, and New Jersey did adult use. And with those new states expanding the legal cannabis market, we also expect probably in short term that um, states such as Pennsylvania and Connecticut and New York will also be starting to legalize um, adult use. So this creates new market opportunities for financial institutions who are either in the space or who are considering getting into the space. But one of the things that um, we're seeing and that I find concerning is the FinCEN report that um, gives the numbers of financial institutions that are openly banking cannabis has declined for the third quarter in a row. Now, there's a couple of reasons that that may be, maybe because um, FinCEN uh, issued some new guidance related to hemp so they don't have to file SARS. And some people speculate that it may be due to staffing issues with COVID so SARS aren't being filed on time. But nevertheless, what it shows me is that there's still financial institutions that are standing on the sidelines waiting for some reason to jump in or still have hesitancies to do so. What I've heard and what I've experienced myself is one of the biggest um, hurdles and hesitations to getting into this space is the liability that officers and directors are um, afraid of, the personal liability and liability for the institutions. And so inevitably when institutions are implementing programs or even considering implementing programs, 
this will, um, the liability that officers and directors face will end up being one of their concerns. So in order to address those concerns, um, it is typically everybody looks for a DNO policies, but like with most things cannabis, there's challenges. So that's why today we're holding this topic and we've got two experts. And um, personally, when I was um, general counsel for Safe Harbor Services, Scott Moskal and Frank served as outside counsel for me and they were the ones I turned to when I had questions on DNO. And they've supported our efforts in the banking group um, throughout the country answering these questions. And so um, Scott, again, is co-chair of the Cannabis Advisory Group and co-chair of the Financial Restructuring and Distress Transaction Group at Burns and Levinson. Very knowledgeable, works very closely with our financial institution clients. But as a result of his work with cannabis operators as well, we can bring both perspectives so we understand. And that's one thing that he's been so helpful with, with um, advising financial institutions who want to get into the space or who are already in, in the space and want to expand some of their offerings. And we're lucky today to also have Patrick Ryder. Um, Patrick is with Hub International. He's the Senior Vice President of Management and Professional Liability. He has more than um, 19 years of experience in customer service and client development. And he works throughout the world with consulting with organizations um, about program design and <laughs> management techniques which is um, absolutely critical to the programs that we're gonna be talking about today. So we're lucky to have his expertise as well. So what we wanted to do is try to run this in a, more of a casual format. So Scott and Patrick are going to um, discuss some of the, the intricacies of, of this area and some of the um, policy considerations and some of the considerations that directors and officers should have for when they're getting into the space or if they're evaluating current coverage that they may have if they're already serving um, cannabis related businesses. Then at the end, we were gonna go ahead and take questions. Um, on the bottom of your screen, you should have a Q&A box. And if you type your questions in at the end of um, their discussion, I'm gonna go ahead and ask both of them the questions if we have any. Certainly, um, if you don't have time to stay that long for the Q&A session, feel free to send the questions to us and then we will do our best to get you some answers. Um, and we're really excited. Hopefully some of the attendees who we saw sign up are in some of the new markets such as South Dakota, Pennsylvania and, and those areas. So we're excited that you're at least considering the space. And um, again, if you have any questions, put them in the box. And without further ado, here's Scott and Patrick. Thanks Katrina, thanks Frank. And certainly thank you, Patrick. Um, I, I would say that you're the expert and, and I'm just along for the ride, um, but it's, it's great to have you here. Um, and let's, so let's talk about DNO or DNO insurance or DNO professional liability insurance. And I think, you know, let's, let's just start with what does DNO, what does this insurance coverage provide? What does it protect? What does it really protect these DNOs yes. from? You know, it's interesting. You, you used a common misnomer there where that people will say it's DNO or professional liability. And there's really a, uh, there's a, a, a definitive line there between the two. So professional liability is obviously the liability associated with the deliverance of professional services. When you talk about directors and officers, you're talking about the services that are delivered to the organization from either the board level or the director level. So there is kind of a, a quasi-professional exposure there in that they're managing a company and they're providing services to the company. Directors and officers traditionally just covers those services provided the management of the comp company and the financial consequences that, that arise from those decisions. As it relates to financial institutions and uh, the decision whether or not to bank cannabis deposits, make loans, or, or participate in this business, you know, there are potential financial consequences that could come from that, whether it's regulatory fines and penalties, uh, a massive withdrawal from a, a, a client base due to the fact that there's a moral you know, objection to the banking of, of cannabis deposits that could impact the bank's bottom line. So the decisions that are made in running a financial institution at the board level or at the director level is what we're trying to pick up coverage for with directors and officers. And, and I know, you know, this is this 
uh, our talk today is centered on specific types of policies or specific type of DNO policy for financial institutions. But but you know just generally in the cannabis space, I know you know a bunch of our clients have had difficulties obtaining, and when I say our clients, I mean plant touching MSOs, SSOs, sure. um, obtaining what I would call um, decent DNO coverage. Um, and I and I know the market's kind of weird. And, and awkward right now because of the whole um, COVID um, situation. But, you know, I, I was looking at a non-cannabis uh, DNO policy earlier and just kind of thinking, okay, well, the, what does this really provide for a cannabis operator or, or an FI? And, you know, I just went through a bunch of the provisions. And for instance, there's an exclusion uh, for no coverage for conduct arising out of or resulting from any deliberate criminal act. Um, there's the definition of loss doesn't include um, any, any uh, amounts that would constitute an amount that's not insurable under the law. Um, and then even with respect to possible rescission, you know, there's provisions that say, you know, if the application contains any misrepresentations or with an actual intent to deceive, which Sometimes, you know, when uh, MRBs or, or cannabis operators don't actually tell you they're a cannabis operator, I think that's when that comes into place. So I guess my question, Patrick, is, I mean, are, is there really any coverage at all? Because it seems to be <laughs> somewhat exclusionary. <laughs> well, you know, it, it depends, right? So the, the cannabis market in general is very tight. Uh, when it comes to the number of carriers that are participating in the types of coverages that are available. So when you talk about directors and officers, there might be seven to 10 markets that are actively participating in the cannabis industry. It comes to financial institution, there's more, but they are actively looking to suppress the exposure that's presented by taking on cannabis deposits or working in that space. With that being said, this is not your typical general liability policy, a typical property policy. Each carrier has their own intricacies and each broker that's working in this space does something a little bit differently in order to affect the policies to create coverage where those exclusions might uh, uh, bar it in, in the beginning. One of the that's interesting that's part, part, yeah, go ahead. Well, so, so Patrick, is it, is it just my paranoia that if you had one of these regular non-cannabis DNO policies and you have and every DNO policy I've seen I've been working in the space since 1999 has the intentional acts exclusion mm -hmm. um, which says you know no coverage if you know you commit a deliberate criminal act or violation I mean is it my imagination that um, insurers might use this as a basis to deny coverage yeah. for cannabis operators because well cannabis is illegal federally so they I have paranoid. <laughs> well, I mean, you're obviously paranoid. That's a fact. We all know that. Yes, yes. But, uh, you know, beyond that, yeah, there have been there has been case law that has shown that carriers and some of the guys that we all know and we see their flags up at golf tournaments have used the illegal ass exclusion to bar coverage in federal court. And honestly, uh, in, once you get to federal court, you're seeing judges that aren't sympathetic to state law. They look at federal law and, and the rules and regulations around that, and they basically see the Controlled Substances Act, boom, you're done, coverage doesn't apply. On the flip side, we have seen in state court some of these saying, well, you knew based off of the application that this was a marijuana-related business or this was, you know, this was a cannabis entity. You offered coverage. We're not going to let you rely on that exclusion. So to that end, what we've seen is some of these larger national carriers do two things. One, increase their applications, which do exactly what you said. It creates the basis for a rescindable policy. So a misrepresentation on an application where you say we're not banking marijuana business, you are banking marijuana business, kaput, that's a misrepresentation, and they can rescind the policy. The issue with that in the event of a claim, rescission only comes in the event of a claim, right? These guys aren't going back through every policy to check your deposit holders and going through all that stuff. But in the event of a claim, they find that they want to rescind the policy. What do they have to do? They got to give back the premium. If there's no consideration, there could be no contract. So they remove the contract and give you back your money. Insurance carriers aren't in the business of giving back money. And so what, what we've seen probably in the last 12 to 15 months is assertion language, specifically as it relates to 
uh, some of the larger carriers in the FI space, there's a certain language that says that if you have banked or you're taking on cannabis related business, the policy is going to assert that there's no coverage because either you didn't, you know, you didn't disclose it, but we don't want to pick that up anyways, because it's federally illegal. So if you look at a company like a, a, a Zurich or a CNA, they have that language that's going into their policies at renewals. And other businesses are saying, you know, they're adding this into the application, at which point in time, they're just not renewing the business. So at renewal, you're seeing them say, okay, listen, we don't want to be involved in that. We're out. And that just depletes the marketplace and creates a lack of a competitive environment for the rest of the folks that are, are participating here. Um, and unfortunately, it's hardening the market from a pricing standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, so premiums are going up and coverage is, is less than desirable with some of the relate, uh, remaining carriers out there. Well, let's just talk for, for a few minutes about Dino solely for plant touching entities. And, and I know we're going to get to FI, so let's, but, you know, sure. I've, you know, we've sent some folks your way uh, over the past, you know, and who are plant touching operators. And I guess the question is, I mean, is there real, any real affordable and, and emphasis or cost effective coverage out there um, that doesn't have what I call a big donut of an exclusion that basically if you were to be found violating the Controlled Substances Act, which every plant touching entity is, um, is a basis for denial. Yeah, so there's it's tough, Scott. I mean, it's yeah. it's a difficult marketplace. When you start talking about publicly traded companies, the coverage is actually fairly robust. Okay. Um, you're looking at the same kind of base coverage form that you would see from a Fortune 1000 publicly traded company, okay. um, and that's a good thing. And the issue there is it's really really expensive. It's not out of line with what we're seeing in some, you know, biotech and IPO, uh, California IPO business, where you're looking at somewhere between a 17 and a half to 22 and a half percent rate. What that means is basically per million, you're paying 175,000 to $225,000 or more for premium for a premium for, right? for a premium. That's correct. And then you're starting at a retention that basically matches the limit. So if you're buying a $5 million limit policy, mm -hmm. your retention at the front end of that is going to be $5 million. Ooh, you can knock I, that. Yeah, so what's the retention? Just so, just so we make sure, you know, people listening know the sure. jargon. So what, what's a retention? A retention is basically a front loaded deductible. So the very first thing that you you see when you work with the DNO claim is you have to hire a lawyer. And, uh, you know, right. Thank God. Uh, we'll thank God. Something. Thank God for lawyers. They're, they're, here, for, they're here to help. Um, but no, you, you, you go through defense costs. And so the initial retainer for the, the policy is you expend X number of dollars on defense. In private companies, it's significantly lower, right? You're not talking about a securities class action. You're not talking about an SEC investigation, although with financial institutions, you can. Um, so you start off with a defense-based retention and you kind of have to pay that up front. And then the indemnification available through the policy is above that retention. So $5 million policy, you could spend a million dollars on the coverage, spend $5 million on the retention before you even touch the limit of insurance. It's really expensive. Um, at the least. To, yeah. And to that end, you know, we've been spending a lot of time looking at different solutions for plant touching uh, companies and, you know, that don't involve traditional risk transfer of insurance, right? So you've got captives that are potentially available. Uh, you've got insurance trusts that are potentially available depending on on how you can collateralize those the issue is cash right cash is king in order to, to collateralize a uh, a captive you have to have a certain amount of cash uh and a lot of that money is not designed to spend on dno policies it's no. designed to build out operations so that's on the public side on the private side it's a lot different Okay. significantly different. So a privately held company, you know, you've got a limited shareholder base, you might have 100 to 200 investors in the company uh, on some of the larger ones. Um, the coverage is just not as robust, you're not getting a publicly, uh, you're not getting a public DNO form, you're getting a private company form, which should be broader and that it provides entity coverage, uh, not just shareholder suits. But 
you're starting to see Controlled Substance Act, uh, CSA exclusions. You're starting to see bankruptcy exclusions, majority shareholder exclusions. And if you're buying a policy that's primary purpose is to defend a director and officer in the event of a bankruptcy for mismanagement, or in the case of something that's antitrust related from a competitive standpoint, um, or from a shareholder that doesn't have board rep, that's a big, that's a big exposure. But if you're excluding all those, what is it actually covering? So understanding what you're buying and who you're buying it from and who you're buying it for is also very important because there's different ways to structure those things. Luckily, in the financial institutions world, because they're not plant touching, there tends to be a broader uh, coverage form available if you know how to manipulate your way through those well, that, illegal well, acts exclusions. Well, that's, that's a good question because I know when we worked with Katrina, when, when she was the client, um, we did look at certain financial institutions, DNO policies that they had in place. And I mean, probably a, no surprise, I kept seeing this intentional criminal acts exclusion. And, you know, I was constantly concerned. And um, I mean, has that, I mean, and I think a lot of my guess is most financial institutions still have that donut in there. Um, what I call a donut for an exclusion. Yeah unless they get a specialized or work, you know, a specialized, uh, I'll call that cannabis type DNO policy for FIs. So there's a, there's a two way go really. Um, one is to manipulate and negotiate through that exclusion. Okay. And that's, that's preferable that's, because that's you can. That's tough though. Cause I've, I've tried that as Katrina's yeah. been on the phone with me. Yeah. And in a broad form, what you're looking for is a state level carve back. The issue is the federal courts may not, may not accept that carve back because it's still federally illegal. So the carve back that we utilize is, you know, it, it basically says, and I've got it pulled up here, um, but not limited to medical adult use marijuana and the applicable state law will govern the definition of the criminal act. It tends to stand up and hold in state court. In federal court, we actually haven't gotten there because there's not a whole lot of outside shareholder activity in the financial institutions that we work with kind of coming into the banks. And those that do have a, you know, a cross-border, so to speak, exposure are generally publicly traded. And so they're already working with a form that, is, that, that will defend them and, and create indemnification above uh, retention anyways. So that's the first way. The second way is to say the entity's on its own. And the entity can indemnify itself. They can take care of, they can pick up the exposure. They can pay for any kind of litigation that comes in. But what the entity is not going to do is the, it, we're not going to indemnify the board because they've made a decision to participate in a federally illegal business. And then you start talking about the structure of the policy. How do you want to do that? And one of the ways that we do that uh, in our industry is create a side A access tower with a DIC component that drops down and cuts through the illegal acts exclusion to provide indemnification only for the directors and officers. So, so only for the separate, board. So when you, uh, when you say a separate side A policy, um, I know what it means, but what does it mean for, for, you know, the customer for the yep. uh, insured? Yeah. So a traditional policy has an ABC component. There's three parts to the policy form. You got side C, which is the entity, mm -hmm. right? So the entity gets sued. Uh, side B is for indemnifiable risk to the directors and officers. That's where the company can still provide indemnification. And most policies will presume that uh, the entity is providing indemnification to the D's and O's. And side A coverage is non-indemnifiable risk. Typically what we see in, in private company business and in public company business mm -hmm. is side A coverage is reserved for a really, really bad day. So think bankruptcy. Think, uh, you know, so, some really nasty stuff where the company cannot or will not indemnify the directors and officers. The problem with the side A policy, the side A coverage component on a private company policy is that it will maintain the policy wording and the exclusion for illegal acts. So above your primary layer, let's just say you buy a primary $5 million DNO policy. Above the primary layer, what we have tended to do is, is create an excess policy that cuts through that illegal acts exclusion and, and, and indemnifies the directors and officers on a first dollar basis. Because if it's a non-indemnifiable claim and there's still a $250,000 retention, you know, Katrina who's sitting on the board will be $250,000 out of pocket before the policy kicks in. So we 
replace that high retention with a $0 retention, coverage responds on a first dollar basis, and we include that cut through language to get to the point where, okay, the bank's not going to indemnify us. The, it, it, it can't because it's a violation of public policy to indemnify you for a claim alleging acts that are illegal. So, so in a way, so is this like a, would you consider this a separate policy just for the directors and officers, or is this because excess generally will follow form, right? Right. So, so this isn't a traditional excess policy, although it kind of, it, it's supplemental, right? It's supplemental, it's excess, and it's standalone. So it's, it's all three wrapped in one. We call it a difference in conditions policy. So the very first part of the policy is to follow form up the tower, and it kind of goes in lockstep. And, and if there's an ABC claim and B and C respond, and then there's excess and, and all the way up until the bank can't indemnify, it will follow form on the terms and conditions. If there is a, a claim that comes in where the bank cannot, or, or I'm sorry, the financial institution cannot or will not indemnify because of violation of public policy or potential bankruptcy, then the policy drops down and it acts as a standalone indemnification policy for the directors and officers only. There's no entity coverage. The bank is separate from this. And that's very important uh, distinction to make because in the event of a bankruptcy. Or, or a receivership of some sort. I receivership assume. in that regard. The DNO policy can become an asset of the organization and be seized. Side A with no entity coverage involved cannot. And, and scarily, I've litigated that in bankruptcy court, but that's that's a story for another day because um, now we're geeking out. But so so let's say, well, Katrina used to be an officer of, of a financial institution. So, you know, they're looking, a financial institutions looking to get into the cannabis banking space. Um, you know, step one, I'm assuming is they look at their DNO policy and, and they'll see this big old donor. You know, what... Then they come to their lawyer, they come to you or whatnot. I mean, what's your general uh, recommendation? Should they negotiate and or purchase like a new overall policy? Do they limit themselves to investigating just the side ADIC policy, combination of both? It depends. Is that for me or is that for Katrina? Oh, that was for you, Patrick. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's important to maintain a traditional insurance program, especially right. for a financial institution that is not going to be exclusive to the cannabis industry. I would tell you that if you're exclusive to the cannabis industry and you're just going to focus on taking deposits and making loans there, don't buy BNC coverage. It's just you'll run into issues with legalities and, and, and regulatory environment that you just don't want to have to, you don't want to have to litigate to get to your policy. So if, but if you are operating in a certain fashion and then you decide that, you know what, we're going to take on a, a million dollars, 5 million, whatever it is. And it's a smaller percentage of your overall portfolio, which is what we see quite often. But the, rates are good. You know, the, the profit margins on taking that business makes sense. Um, you know, considering adjusting your program to take on a, a DIC component above your traditional insurance would make sense because you're on the board that takes on that exposure. I would probably want to cover myself for that. Yeah, pr pr probably. Um, well, not probably, definitely. But, you know, when you, you, you've mentioned pricing is better, you know, so earlier we're talking about that the, you know, the, the premiums for plant mm -hmm. touching are expensive. And we were talking about these incredible retentions. Um, and, you know, there weren't that many choices, you know, obviously a little bit more on the public side, but there aren't that many choices. Um, when you go to uh, applying or looking for a DNO on behalf of the bank or credit union, or other financial covered financial institution, I mean, is the price, is the pricing really better? Is there, is there really more selection? And I think most importantly, I'm assuming if it's side A, there's, there's very little of a retention, but, but sometimes we know what happens when we assume. So side A is zero retention. It's a first dollar. It comes down to the first dollar and why we provide a DIC component is for exactly this, right? If it is a non-indemnifiable claim, 
we don't want the D's and O's paying out of pocket to access the insurance. That is, so there's no retention associated with it. Um, and it's there for the directors and officers. Pricing for financial institutions varies widely between carriers. It is certainly not to the extent that public company directors and officers is for, uh, uh, you know, an MSO. Uh, it's not even to the point where you would see it for a traditional financial institution, you know, think, you know, a New York publicly traded bank or, or somebody in the Midwest or somebody like that. They're not going to be paying the same rates as an MSO that's traded in Canada, which, by the way, is ridiculous. The fact that we're ta we're talking about you know twenty two and a half percent rate for a Canadian publicly traded company is absolutely absurd, but when you start looking at financial institutions, you're looking at very specialized policy forms, mm -hmm. right? It's a combination of DNO and ENO because they are providing professional services to their constituents and to to their you know uh, their clients, um, and so there's a, a very specialized coverage form you're probably looking at retentions that start at twenty-five dollars to $50,000 to go up from there, depending mm -hmm. on the uh, amount of assets held by the bank. And one of the arguments that we make is, right, if you're a billion-dollar asset bank and you're taking on $10 million worth of cannabis deposits, is that really material to your operation? No, it's not. And so we, we make the case that, hey, you want to stay on risk. It's still a good risk. The only the only negative here is that they're taking on less than 5%, less than 10% of their annual assets to make some more money. And that's good for DNO, right? If you right. show profit margin, that is good. And that, that insulates litigation. Um, and so it, the liability is not as great if a, it's a smaller percentage of your business, uh, of your business. And I saw a question in here about professional liability for like a lawyer or an accountant. Uh, same thing applies. It depends on how much of your practice is going to be associated with marijuana related activity. I will tell you that uh, hemp, not a big deal. If you're working with strictly CBD, it's, it's non-material at all. But if you are a cannabis firm and it makes up 50% of your annual revenue, you're probably going to pay more in premium. Sure. But you're uh, on these ancillary businesses, you're not going to see a great deal of difference in coverage. Um, what you'll see is a narrowing of, of markets that are available to you, but we've had a great deal of success in negotiating uh, with professional liability with law firms and, and accounting firms that are in this space saying, Hey, this is a standard form. Let's get into standard business. And, and so there are a lot of, you know, and let's return to banks in a second, but there's a lot of groups out there doing consulting or management, um, providing management services um, to the cannabis industry. So, um, so there's hope that there is E&O or professional liability insurance for them at somewhat of an affordable basis with, with decent coverage options. Yeah, it's uh, the, it's the coverage is fairly it's somewhat, <laughs> somewhat, and that's a, that's a, a well done qualifier there. Uh, allegedly there's coverage up. Um, I will tell you that for consultants, it's still a little bit tough. Okay. Uh, you're, you know, anybody that's on the call is, is familiar with what we refer to as the cannabis tax. So if you are in the business and you are, are in and around it, uh, you're going to pay a little bit more for everything, whether that's a guy swinging a hammer to build your building, whether that's an insurance broker selling you insurance or whether that's a, a lawyer defending you there are there is a tax to be paid in the insurance world for mrbs uh related and ancillary the tax is probably two and a half to three times mm -hmm. um in directors and officers plant touching businesses for for that stuff the tax is more like five to ten depending on on the financial condition of the company shareholder base and some other you know some other underwriting criteria but the tax is legit it's real so, so then turn, let's, let's just turn back to uh, FIs for a second or sure. however long we have left. So, you know, and, and when an FI is contemplating getting into the industry, there's a lot of different things they need to um, investigate various vendors, which are crucial. And when I say industry, obviously cannabis, uh, taking cannabis deposits, but from an insurance perspective, um, other than calling you <laughs> and other than being completely transparent through the entire time. Um, is there anything that the board or the officers should do to kind of make the underwriting process that much easier? Um, you know, 
any kind of hints that you you have, or is just here's here's the application. You've already filled out your normal DNO. Let's I will it. tell you, yeah, I would say that from a management liability side, transparency is good. Uh, understanding what your strategy is going to be around uh, cannabis deposits and cannabis banking, period. So there is a significant difference from an underwriting standpoint in taking deposits and holding them and just kind of charging a fee and making loans. Right. So as soon as you dip into the fact that you're going to be making loans and, and, and really leveraging the bank's ability uh, to create revenue off of loans to a marijuana related company, and you're going to help them build their building, you're going to help them hire folks. Right. I mean, you're going to create a business loan for a plant touching entity that's going to spook some underwriters um, and okay. you're going to narrow your your field a little more. Existing relationships with carriers won't matter. Right. So if you are sitting here in Denver, Colorado, and you have a 20 year relationship with uh, your bank and you've decided, you know, I'm sorry, your insurance carrier, and you say to them, OK, we're going to take on cannabis deposits. And you happen to be one of the golf course guys. Right. CNA, Chab, Travelers, Chubbs, or they're not going to care. They are not going to care. They okay. are going to add assertion language. They are going to potentially non-renew your property and casualty program mm -hmm. as well. Um, there are significant ramifications from the standard markets. Uh, they just don't want to be around it. They are, you know, it is such a minute portion of their portfolio. They're operating under the 5% rule. Don't let the 5% ruin the 95%. So they're mm -hmm. just not going to do it. Um, but you work with some other carriers that, that people may not have heard of, sure. financially sound, very strong, uh, but true risk-bearing entities, right? They, they're willing to take risk and they're willing to price for that risk. But just be ready that you may have a dramatic shift in your program away from a carrier that you've been with for 20 years. So, so you mentioned about loans just earlier and that, you know, if, if a um, FI is making loans that could... Um, increase the premiums, make it more difficult, subject to renewal. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference if you're making loans to, uh, let's say, an ancillary company versus an actual plant touching? And by ancillary, yes. I mean, you know, totally separate special purpose vehicle that's buying the real estate and then leasing it out to the actual um, plant touching entity, but itself is one step removed. Does that, does that yeah. matter or... It does. It, it, oh, it absolutely does. It, it absolutely does. Right. So if you are working with a real estate firm and they've decided that they're going to buy a block in downtown Denver and, and part of that block at the end of it, upon renovation, they're going to, you know, lease out a portion of it to native roots. That's fine. Right. You're, you're not leasing. You're not doing anything with the plant touching entity. You're basically funding construction. That's and that's OK. Um, if you're funding construction to an LLC that is under the corporate umbrella of a plant touching entity, that's different. And we've seen those REITs pop up and, and raise money in different ways. Uh, I think that's a little bit different than a financial institution's exposure, but I will tell you that if there's anybody on the call that's working in private equity or through a REIT and your investment strategy is around cannabis, it's going to be more expensive. It's just the, the coverage needs to be altered. It needs to be, specialized around that space. And I, I, I'll say the same thing about SPACs, which have, have really come into vogue in the last two years. I think you know, the multi-billion dollar SPACs, and I think there's a huge one out in California right now that's just gobbling up stuff. Those guys are paying a grip for their insurance right now. Um, I think there was one, uh, I think the rate is somewhere in the neighborhood for a two-year policy term of $750,000 for a $2 million policy. And uh, yeah, and that's just side A. <laughs> oh, wow. Jeez. Which makes sense for a SPAC right. because the vehicle's not going to exist post-transaction and that's when the litigation is going to come. So it's not there to indemnify the D's and O's anyways, but uh, it's really very expensive. So I, I know we're running close to out of time and, and we do want to get to questions, but I, I do have sort of one last topic and, and that's, that's on the Safe Banking Act. And, and it looks more and more likely, regardless of what happens in the uh, Georgia special election, that there's a good chance the Safe Banking Act will, will pass in some capacity, uh, especially with uh, uh, Senator Toomey taking over from Pennsylvania, the banking committee, who's a Republican, uh, if the Republicans uh, keep Georgia. 
on the board. And I guess my question for you is, will this impact the, the insurance, the DNO market at all? Uh, will it make things easier, cheaper, more affordable, different limits, different products, or is it just, hey, it's, it's DNO and DNO for non-cannabis companies is expensive and difficult as it is? Or yes. Uh, I think it'll make it, I think it'll make it easier, right? So that okay. we started off the conversation talking specifically around coverage and why that illegal acts exclusion is so onerous, right? There's a lot of gray area depending on where litigation is brought, what what venue there is, and 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 who's defining illegal acts. If the Safe Banking Act passes and the ability to bank cannabis becomes legal, that opens up a tremendous amount of room from a coverage standpoint. That does sure. not necessarily mean that it opens up any room from an appetite standpoint. So you could still have the big three, the big four, the big five say that we're going to continue on with our assertion language because we don't feel comfortable with the exposure. Even though you're taking deposits and you're making loans and everything is on the up and up, we just don't like the exposure. So you could well, still have also it. Because, because also because cannabis will remain federally illegal with just solely the passage of the SAFE Act, right? So that should... right. Right. It, 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 all it would really do, in my opinion, is say that, OK, that illegal acts exclusion, it's no longer illegal to bank cannabis, right. still illegal to sell it, still illegal to have it, still illegal to smoke it. But it's not illegal to bank businesses that are in that industry. That's that's really the benefit there. It will open up some avenues to folks. Um, I just don't see it being again, that whole portfolio program. Why bother? Why get into it? Because if you're going to start looking at, at banks that are saying, oh, great, now I can take this on and I can make loans to people. Where is the cannabis index right now for MSOs <laughs> as, as compared to where it was two years ago, right? I mean, the burn rate of these entities has been massive. And you're looking at people that are struggling financially, and then you're going to give them a $20 million loan. I don't know from a DNO standpoint if I really want to walk into that, or from a professional liability standpoint on a carrier side if I want to walk into that exposure. So, I, I think even with the passage of it, I think the language in the policy gets better okay. and more easily approached if litigation comes. I just don't think carrier appetite will shift with it immediately. I think we're probably, you know, federal legalization plus X to get okay. the right actuarial data there for the big guys to really participate. Got it, got it. Well, this has been really informative. And I think it's been probably very informative for a lot of our um, audience. Um, obviously, you know, to the extent folks have questions or want to approach you because they're interested in getting this space, I think there was information on a general um, invite, um, but certainly Patrick, if you want to plug yourself for a second before we get to the questions, uh, feel free. Sure. Thank you, Scott. Uh, <laughs> Patrick Ryder, Hub International Insurance Services out of Denver, Colorado. Uh, I sit on top of our national cannabis practice for management liability. So my focus is really on complex risk and in financial institutions, uh, specifically as it relates to the management liability exposures. Uh, we have 13,000 employees. We've got over 400 offices across the United States. Uh, my job is to support our sales force mm -hmm. and really create the solutions uh, for the companies that want to work and participate in this industry. And as much as we talked about scaring people, right? I mean, part of my job is to scare people into buying insurance. This is a great industry. There are some really cool people that are involved here. They're doing an amazing job. They're doing some really fun stuff. And there's only so many times in my life that I'm going to see the opportunity to get in on the ground floor and be part of something that is not just an industry, but it's really a movement. I know, Scott, you have a personal connection. And I, I think as you kind of go through this, you'll find a lot of people that have a personal connection to cannabis right. and the stories and the people are, are fascinating. Uh, so if you're thinking about doing it, you know, you've got some great resources here to talk to, uh, and we're happy to support you to, to help grow this industry. Do you want, do you want to give your email, how do people or contact you? <laughs> sure. It's patrick.rider at hubinternational.com. Um, you can also find me on LinkedIn as Patrick Ryder, and I look like this. And, and it's R Y 
D-E-R. Not just R- like the trucks. That's right. Just like the trucks. No relation, which is why I'm selling insurance. <laughs> so, so Katrina, let's turn it to you if we have some questions. I, I know we got about 10 minutes left. So we um, just have one, one question that Patrick hasn't already addressed. And, and I think it's a great question to kind of summarize everything that you've been talking about, which is, in your opinion, what sh- should a bank or a financial institution, credit union, considering getting into the space, um, what, if any, special considerations are there or should they be thinking about um, regarding their um, obtaining um, insurance for their new corporate or their new cannabis banking program? Good question. Um, you know, the considerations are really are, are twofold. What, who are you going to bank? Are you going to bank lawyers, accountants, uh, testing facilities, labs, uh, security forces, are you going to be touching, are you going to be considering taking on straight cannabis deposits, cash deposits from cannabis firms? Once you make that consider, you know, once you develop that strategy around your uh, cannabis portfolio, then it's time to start looking at the illegal last exclusion in your policy, whether or not as a board of directors and, and as a, you know, as a C-suite representative, you want to consider some personal asset protection from a side A policy and expanding your d and uh, really taking a hard look at the conduct illegal act exclusion. And, and you may have an existing program in place right now that has ABC, has side A, right? You may be working at a financial institution that has a robust DNL platform. Doesn't mean that the language is right. And so I would just encourage you to work with your broker or somebody that you trust, like a Scott Moskal, uh, <laughs> to review your policies in order to feel comfortable with how coverage is going to be apply in the event of a claim. The second part of this is, again, if you're with the ABA, and you've got a great American policy. It's a great policy for them. They're good people. They know what they're doing. And they are not shying away from this. Understand that their policy is not going to remove or carve back that illegal acts exclusion. You can stay there and they'll stay with you. However, really consider that, that side ADIC with some carve back language I think is important. <laughs> and on the property and casualty side, don't think that just because most of the exposure is from a DNO standpoint, that you're safe from non-renewal of a property and casualty program. So in this particular market right now where we are, um, your insurance program, if you're concerned about your corporate insurance program, start your underwriting early. Um, the DNO market in particular is hard. We're looking at, you know, underwriters have 250 submissions at a time on their desk right now. It's insane because of the way that the rate structure and bankruptcies are coming in and, and the impacts of COVID and, and the unknown, there's a lot of marketing going on. And so carriers are really slammed and, and stretched for resources, right? You can't get everybody in a room at one time to walk through 20 risks. And so it's just taking longer. So get out early. Same is true on the property and casualty side, right? Anytime you see a depressed economy, um, regardless of what the stock market is doing, we've seen a ton of activity uh, on the property side, specifically from property damage. And that's not just domestically from, from some of the civil unrest. We've seen tornadoes, we've seen hurricanes, we've seen these things that are impacting the property market and hardening that as well. So I'd encourage you to start your renewal process, not 60 days out, not 30 days out, more in the 90 to 120 days out. Just give yourself time, be ready to adjust, and be ready for some increases, not just cannabis related, but you're looking at 25% increase across the board right now on your property casualty programs. So start developing a strategy as to how you tell your story and what you're going to do to mitigate loss and risk to carriers and separate yourself from the herd. I think all of that's important right now. But, but I, I want to just add one thing, uh, and I think this is also important. You know, back three, four, five years ago, there really was a lack of true uh, functional policies or policy alternatives for banks and credit unions. And I know Katrina yep. and I worked on some of this together. I think the good news is, yes, it might be more costly, but there are alternatives or, or there are um, policies or products available to kind of plug any hole that your present DNO policy might have. This is true. I think I think you know let's let's end it on a good note. Um, yes, it might be more expensive, 
But as opposed to like three or four years ago, there is actually good coverage available. This is true. And just think about it. If you're getting that much percentage on your deposits, you can afford a little more coverage. It's a good thing. <laughs> there you go. It's like paying taxes, right? If you pay taxes, you made money and that's all good. <laughs> <laughs> Katrina, any more questions or is that that we- no, I just want to um, reiterate and underscore what Patrick said is I've seen it a million times. So if you're out there and you're um, uh, one of the members of the team who's exploring cannabis banking, if you start early, like Patrick said, it's going to help your board feel more comfortable with the decision of actually banking cannabis because you would have already explored this and it will um, alleviate some of those delays that may happen when you don't understand what is going to be coming down the road with this. So on that note, I also want to let everyone know that in January, on January 6th, we're going to have another webinar on payroll providers in the cannabis industry. Um, how it affects the industry itself, but also those financial institutions that may be interested in helping bank these pay, um, payroll processors. And so that we'll have Paragon and um, Adaptive HR on as guests. So we hope you can attend those as well. And um, other than that, Scott, that's all. I'd just like to thank both you and Patrick and all our attendees. And if you have any questions, you should have our contact information. Um, please feel free to reach out because we'd love to help you and um, we appreciate you attending. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Happy Thanks holidays. Lot, Scott. Happy holidays, guys. Take care.